I really don't think that there's any doubt that whoever wrote the commentary on Isaiah uh, was a universalist, and it's traditionally been attributed to Basil. There's been some question about that, but if we suppose that he did write it, then it would actually cohere fairly well with some things that he does say in uh, his On the Holy Spirit, which there really isn't any debate that he wrote. Something in particular that I did notice is that his interpretation of 1 Corinthians 3, uh, where Paul talks about the fire testing whatever kind of works each of us has done, and Hart, Bogakov, in at least the modern day, see that passage as applying to everybody. Everybody will be saved, but through fire, right? At least for those who, who need that purification. Basil, in the On the Holy Spirit, seems to interpret that the passage as applying to everybody as well, right? Because there's a debate today over whether that passage um, applies to just Christians, or does it apply to everybody? If it applies to everybody, then that's universal salvation. If it applies to just Christians, well then, that's, it's not. So for example, in chapter 15 of On, on the Holy Spirit, he in, seems to interpret this passage as um, being about ju the judgment for everybody. Right? Uh, so he says, he himself will baptize you in the spirit and fire. So that's from Matthew, um, talking about Jesus. And then he says, by the baptism of fire, he means the trial at the judgment. As the apostle says, the fire will test what kind of works belong to each. And again, the day will make it manifest because it is revealed in fire. Right? So there's no indication there that he thinks that text is simply about uh, Christians. He seems to think it's about everyone. And if you look at what he has to say about this text in uh, the commentary on Isaiah, um, it's very clear that he interprets that passage in a universalist way, um, that all will be saved, some have to go through the fire. Now, I think maybe the most interesting thing in On the Holy Spirit is not necessarily anything that he explicitly says, but he's uh, very clear that, as Scripture says, right, one can only confess Christ in the Holy Spirit. Um, so he's very clear that uh, those in hell would not be able to confess Christ um, through the Holy Spirit. And what that means then is that when you have a passage like Philippians 2, where it says that you know all will confess um, that Jesus Christ is Lord, the only way that they could do that given the logic of what Basil's saying here is that they would have to do that in the Holy Spirit. So that means that this would be a joyful consent rather than some sort of um, boot on the neck of, you know, making people just submit even though they hate you, which is kind of how others have to interpret that passage in Philippians 2. So in relation to, you know, confessing Christ in the Holy Spirit, he says this, or according to one of the evangelists, they will be completely cut off, and this cutting off is understood to be complete alienation from the Spirit. But in Philippians 2, it says that no one will be alienated from that Spirit because they will all confess Christ. So he, and that's my interpretation. He goes on. For the body is not divided so that part is handed over for punishment and part is forgiven. This is the stuff of myths anyway, and when the whole sins, a just judge would not punish half. Neither is the soul cut in two, rather the whole soul makes itself a wholly sinful mind, and the body becomes its co-worker in evil. The cutting off, as I said, is the soul's perpetual alienation from the spirit. Okay. So you do have words like perpetual and, and things in there. Origen used those words as well. So I don't think that that's an absolute case that he wasn't a universalist, but I think the interesting part here is that he says a little bit further below this, uh, this is why there is no one confessing in hell and no one remembers God in death. The help of the spirit is no longer present. So if no one is confessing Christ in hell, then if you look at that Philippians 2 passage, 
that would imply, given Basil's theology, that no one is in hell, since no one can confess Christ in hell. And he says things like this, uh, you know, a number of different times throughout on the Holy Spirit. Right? And he's really quoting Paul because Paul said that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Basil really emphasizes that point in on the Holy Spirit because he's trying to make a case for the divinity of the Holy Spirit. But the implications that that has for uh, a universal confession of Christ in Philippians 2, I think, are, are great. I think there's a lot of um, big implications there. And we, of course, know that the universalist interpretation of, of Philippians 2 by Gregory of Nyssa, Basil's brother, and by Origen, that's exactly how they interpret it. So Basil would definitely have been aware of this interpretation. And he does seem in his commentary on Isaiah to essentially say this, right? So if we look at a certain passage in his commentary on Isaiah, uh, he essentially seems to confirm that that, that is his interpretation of, of, of Philippians 2. So you do find more than once in uh, this commentary on Isaiah passages like this. So, uh, quote, The peace of Solomon was limited to the recorded years, whereas the peace from the Lord is coextensive with the whole of eternity being unlimited and boundless for all shall be subjected to him and shall recognize his mastery and when god shall be all in all and those making an uproar by their apostasies are silenced all in peaceful harmony shall praise god with hymns so i think it's pretty clear there when he's talking about all in peaceful harmony shall praise god with hymns that definitely seems to be an interpretation of philippians 2. So the two would, would really go hand in hand. So the main reason that uh, people would deny that Basil is a universalist is because he has this passage in his, his rules for monks. But it is well known that particularly those types of, of writings, and Basil's in particular, has um, things that are written by other people than just Basil. Um, and so what he says about universalism in there it's perfectly plausible that, that he didn't write it and that someone else did. And it would definitely make a lot more sense if he didn't write it because his brother, whom he appointed bishop, was Gregory of Nyssa, and he's uh, the most explicit uh, universalist we can find in Christian history other than maybe Evagrius. For if at a certain moment there is an end to Ionios punishment, Ionios life will certainly have an end as well. Okay, so I think the argument here is, is over what does Ionios mean? Does it mean eternal or, or for an age? The person goes on to say, and if we do not admit of thinking this concerning life, what reason should there be for assigning an end to Ionios punishment? In fact, the characterization of Ionios is equally ascribed to both. For Jesus states, these will go to Ionios punishment and the righteous to Ionios life. If one accepts this, one must understand that the expressions, one will be punished with many stripes or with few do not indicate an end, but a difference in punishment. So essentially this person is trying to say that uh, we know that um, the Ionios life spoken of in Matthew 25 uh, is eternal. Therefore, the Ionius punishment um, that's spoken of would also have to be eternal for things to make sense in this passage. Uh, that's that's the, the point here. But for a deception of the devil, many people, as though they forgot these and similar statements of the Lord, espouse the theory of the end of punishment out of an audacity that is even superior to their sin. <laughs> so the person's pretty upset about it. So uh, it would be very odd right, if Basil actually wrote this passage in his Rules for Monks because I, he calls them uh, deceived by the devil. Uh, so that would imply that he thought that his brother, who he appointed bishop, his sister, Macrina, uh, his good friend, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, most likely, right, he's probably a universalist, but also St. Gregory the Wonderworker, I don't really think there's any doubt about that, that St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, um, big follower of Origen, was a universalist. And uh, 
Basil clearly and, and on the Holy Spirit um, loves you know, St. Gregory the Wonder Worker. So that would be implying then that all of these people who he's absolutely loves um, and respects their theology, that he thinks they're all deceived by the devil, which is, that's, you know, the way that people talk about heretics. It just doesn't seem very likely to me that Basil would have, have written that. I think there is a pretty good case to be made um, that Basil Gregory of Nyssa's brother was a universalist.